Igor quickly equipped his PCM, recharging the box. His palms were shaking and his fingers were shaking violently, but the movements were honed and familiar. He slammed the box shut, picked it up and flicked it into the machine gun. The weapon was ready for battle and so was Igor himself. His heart was pounding wildly and the young man mentally ordered himself to calm down. It's always worked. Well, maybe not always, but 90% of the time. And now with a loud exhalation, hope entered the soul and the body was ready to act as needed. He put down the machine gun and took out his favorite Steshkin from the holster. Well, where are you there, creature? There was no answer. Instead, Igor heard a grenade hit and bounce on the concrete floor in front of him, literally two meters away. Holy shit! He made a convulsive movement with his foot to open the grenade, but it was too far away. Then he fell head over heels to the right, got on all fours and tried to crawl into the wall. There was an explosion from behind and my back burned with pain and heat. It was as if everything was over, but he was still alive. He felt himself and could resist, could still live. There was a nasty hissing in his ears. He couldn't hear anything. His temples were oppressed with pain. I understood. I was shell-shocked, badly, but it seems to be still intact. He sprawled on his stomach out of impotence, but his consciousness and will to live were enough to remove the grenade from his chest, pull it up to his face and tear off the ring with his molars. The calculation was simple. I'll die, but you're a bastard. You won't live. Now he will come out from behind the wall. He will come. Maybe he will be breathing heavily. His eyes are red with anger and tension. Or maybe he will smile brazenly and obscenely, speaking aloud. Or maybe... Igor felt a strong kick in his side, and now he's already here, he's nearby. For Igor himself, it remained a mystery why and for what purpose his enemy tried to turn his body over on his back, probably wanted to search the dead. Or maybe out of curiosity, the fight was tough. But Yegor needed it, now he will pay for everything, for himself, for the dead boys who were beaten up on the second floor. Now... He opened his eyes, threw out his arm with incredible force and grabbed his enemy by the leg, knocked him down and crawled on top. He pressed his forehead against his forehead and screamed furiously. Die! The eyes of the enemy filled with fear and surprise, the click of the grenade lever and the explosion. The explosion is a flash of fire, heat and deadly fragments. Death one and the same for two, just 15 minutes ago. Oh, how fleeting is the time spent in pleasure and how long it lasts during the fight. It seemed like an hour or so had passed, but only 15 minutes had passed. And just a quarter of an hour ago, the commander, stunned by the battle, holding his bruised and bandaged second arm with his good hand, shouted directly into Yegor. Igor's ear. Igor, let's run to the basement. They can go through there. We'll hold them from here and you go there so that more than one bitch does not pass, Igor yelled back. Plus, let's do it, Commander. He picked up his PCM, checked the boxes and crawled, trying to stay below the broken window openings, crawled down to the descent. Without stopping moving, he turned to the second machine gunner, nodded at him and smiled, trying to cheer him up. But he did not pay attention to Yegor, he was ensuring his brothers who were fighting off Kalash on the north side of their five-story building on the outskirts of the city. Suddenly, not even by hearing, but by instinct, Igor heard the pop of a grenade launcher under the barrel. The guys are fighting back, everything is as it should be, they were promised help, but where is it? Already in the basement, I heard the call sign and the commander's voice on the radio. Igor, hold the basement, if it works, I will give you help. The sounds of Machine Gunfire, then Machine Gunfire, a deafening explosion and a scream, and then the rustling of the voice on the air again. Igor, hold the basement. And so he died, he and his enemy. The heavens will open, they will be surrounded by the light of golden glory, and under the chorale of angels, in the tone of singing that shimmers like a stream, the Archangel Michael is invisibly and barely perceptibly, but at the same time menacingly and majestically, on the scorched earth, on the charred and chipped concrete next to the dead Igor. He will speak loudly and inescapably in the voice of the universe itself and conducting. Stand up, warrior, and your place is at my right hand, for there is no honor higher than to die in battle for one's friends and brothers. And Igor's soul, purified by ashes and fire, rushing through light through light millennia, will find itself in paradise. Amazing, wonderful and fast. It can't be any other way. That's what the military chaplain said before he was sent to this damn front. But the unexpected happened. It sounded funny and brisk from behind. Hey, bro. Hey. 
Igor turned around and saw a guy with a burned face. He held out his hand and the men greeted each other in a brotherly greeting, as if they had known each other for a long time. That's great. And why is it so quiet? I don't understand. Did they fail? The man chuckled. Passed. How not to pass? Your commander was thrown down. The rest were finished off. I didn't get through. Igor jumped up and ran swearing to the stairs. How is that? Is everyone dead there? I couldn't run. The stranger pulled at the evacuation strap and pulled it towards himself. Stop it, you idiot! Look! He turned Igor to the side. Look! The guy saw a concrete floor and two corpses on the floor. One on top of the other, but somehow sideways and unnaturally. From above. He was the corpse from above, Igor. From the surprise of what had opened, from misunderstanding of what was happening, Igor rubbed his eyes with his fist, shook his head and then looked at the alien guy slid over his camouflage and saw a chevron. Someone else's chevron. Is that? Is that me? You, you. And here's under you. It's already me. By the way, let me introduce myself. Andrei, Gosha's call sign. Yegor hesitantly held out his hand again. And how is that, huh? Are we alive or not? Gosha grinned. I don't think so anymore. You blew us up with a grenade. By the way, I salute your action very courageously. And yet it was I who extinguished you. Foolishly, I decided to turn you over. Look you in the eye. I don't know what the hell pulled me. I gave you a chance. Yegor stared at his dead self in amazement, then turned his gaze to Gosha. Your head was blown off. Gosha nodded. Yes, and you are no better. I can imagine what they'll say when they find us. If they find it. There was an explosion from the side and behind, and then gunfire rang out from above. Someone was shouting, giving commands, urging and swearing. I think there's a fight in the building again. And why are your people clinging to this box so much? Igor took a pack of cigarettes out of his pocket, lit one himself and handed it to Gosha. Surprisingly, half an hour ago, he was ready to bite into his throat and no, 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 reveling in blood, but now indifference, ordinariness and as if the evidence of what was happening reigned in his soul. I don't know myself. We moved out last night and came out in the morning. Your guards have been removed. We took it. And today, I don't even know how to say it. Gosha waved his hand before he could finish. Well, today we died in this basement. Uh, yes. After all, at first, he thought of fearing a pistol at the passage so that you would move away. Then to throw the empty box from the machine gun, Aside, you would be distracted and it could go in from the flank. Gosha clicked his tongue negatively. No, I put a quick trip wire in that aisle while you were poking around. It would have been enough for you. Yes, and I felt that you were cooking some kind of trap. That's why I threw the grenade and then I saw your silhouette. Well, you know, where did he hurt you? Igor felt himself. He was healthy now. One might even say perfect. His body was filled with health and strength. Is it a body? Though, there's a body leaning on the concrete. The devil knows. I was concussed. I didn't understand. Figured you'd want to search me. So you pulled up a grenade. Gosha went to the wall and sat down, pulling the machine gun to his chest and bending his knees. He mimicked it. Search it. I wanted to look you in the eye. If I thought I'd want to search, then that's who you are. I tried my own on someone else's. Igor sat down opposite. Yeah, of course, tell me about it. If I had opened the box, you would have been distracted, and your stretching is for the hens to laugh at. He made me laugh. He put a trip wire on. I'd come up from the flank and stab you in the back. You should be lying down now, not me. Understood? Got it, got it. Only our building was taken. Igor snapped the box off his machine gun. It's funny, but his pro machine gunner was wounded by the same machine gunner, only from the other side. Nothing. They'll take it back now. 40 more people will be killed and taken. That's for sure. Still, you wouldn't have gone through my stretch and I wouldn't fall for your deception. Suddenly, laughter rang out. It seemed that the walls themselves were laughing in an evil, cruel, mocking way. Through the laughter, Igor and Gosha heard a voice squealing, Try again! Consciousness was clouded. Soul or body, whatever the hell it was, swept over the ground, collapsed into them right through the roof of the building where the battle was taking place. 
Igor saw from the corner of his eye, with only a subtle perception, a fighter fighting in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Someone was hitting with a machine gun, shouting obscenities, someone collapsed on a concrete floor littered with broken bricks. A shot through plastic teapot lay like an absurd black spot among the bricks. Burnt sheets of burnt books were flying. But it was not unusual. It was a battle, a war. What was unusual and frightening was that behind the soldiers stood black, furry, and horned creatures that looked like devils. They held cross-shaped frames over the soldiers, quickly moved them, spoke in the voices of soldiers and laughed. Soldiers dying and fighting to the death were their puppets, toys, subordinated to their will. Suddenly one of the soldiers was shot through the chest. The devil behind him threw away the cross frames and immediately took up the others, pulling the threads up strongly. The soldier raised his hands and screamed, but at the same time the devil screamed in the voice of a soldier. I give up, I give up guys. With the whistling of a projectile and the swiftness of the wind, Yegor found himself back in his body. He no longer remembered what had happened. He did not remember the conversation with Gosha. He did not remember seeing the puppet soldiers and devils. He held a machine gun in his hands and quickly equipped an empty box with tape. I clicked it on the machine gun, and then he put it down and took out his favorite stechkin from the holster. Well, where are you there, creature? He took the empty box and threw it aside, intending to distract his opponent, rush and flank him. There was no response to his cunning idea, instead Igor heard a grenade hit and bounce off the concrete floor in front of him literally two meters away. Holy shit! Novorossiya 2015 the second story, this house seemed quite ordinary, in the sense that it was a simple multi-story box divided into useful and household space, apartments, entrances, passages, a garbage chute and an elevator in each entrance. Identical window frames shone out somewhere inside covered with curtains, somewhere closed blinds and somewhere bare showing walls covered with wallpaper. An ordinary residential high-rise building, of which there are many in any city, but there was something so grey, gloomy about her. It seems that elderly old women are sitting at the entrance, one in a colorful old-fashioned dress, the second in a light blue robe or nightgown with a white scarf on her head, and the third with incredibly thick swollen shins in a jacket thrown over a chemise. I heard that they drank there without drying out, so they drank themselves to death. And why, there's Yurik and his mom in the next doorway drinking black, so he stabbed her in a drunken case. He also did God knows what over her there. But what? Everyone knows. The old woman in the kerchief grinned with her toothless mouth, wiped the seed husk from her chin. Yes, he cohabited with her. I knew her when she was young, and she took a walk from her husband on the sly, and then he hanged himself out of resentment. I know what I'm saying. An argument broke out. Each of the old gossip girls believed that she was right and was better informed. They passed off gossip after gossip, but with the air of broadcasting universal truths, grinned, fell silent for a moment, and then passionately gave out what was made up in their heads. An untidily dressed young woman came out of the entrance, her face swollen from drinking and tears. She did not say hello, walked from the entrance to the courtyard, and leaned her hands on a rickety wooden table, darkened by time, at which local old men and men played dominoes, and sometimes they could crush a bottle. The woman shouted towards the playground, Andrei Kolka, go home now! Two boys of five and six years old ran towards her from the creaking swing. The woman waited for them and drove them home. Get in the house now! What are you making up? Stepfather is dead, wake, and you go for a walk? She interspersed words with obscenities, shouted and walked quickly to the entrance. The voice was irritated, one might even say angry. What is most unpleasant, the anger in her voice did not seem instantaneous, caused only now, it was habitual, it was constant. At the very entrance, a woman slapped the older boy on the back of the head. Come on, let's go! The wooden front door slammed shut. The old women silently watched. But after the woman and her children disappeared into the entrance, they immediately began talking in different voices. Stepfather died. Did you hear that? Yes, she strangled him with a pillow, Lenka. Here was a girl. She took everything, both intelligence and beauty. And when my parents died, I got involved with one, then now with this goat. The old woman stopped, covering her mouth with a wrinkled plump palm. Fuck me, fuck me, she spat on the left. 
you can't take but care of the dead. I got involved with this. He beat her up almost every day, got her addicted to drinking, and she has the children. Ragamuffins. My Vitka was walking with them, so a week later I looked into his head, and there... The old woman paused and looked expectantly at her friends. What's in there? Well, tell me. The grandmother put her hands on her knees, stretched out her neck, and slowly moving her shoulders from left to right, almost screamed. The knights are there. Lies. Suddenly, as if from nowhere, a young man in a black cassock appeared in front of them. Hey, Polly Telibowed. Hello, dear ones. Can you tell me, is this Overrush Naya Street House 12? I need the 68th apartment. The grandmothers nodded. Here, here, father. Are you going to the dead man? He's on the fourth floor. The door is straight. The young priest crossed himself and said in a barley audible voice, Lord, your will! With these words, he entered the entrance. The grandmothers looked after him, and a new topic for gossip appeared. Look, the beard has barely grown, and already the priest. Kid, how old is he? Probably not even 30. Father Andrew himself in the world and in the church, Father Andrew entered the entrance and took hold of the railing with his hand. He walked up to the elevator. It didn't work. The entrance itself smelled of concrete, a clogged garbage chute and something so subtle, unclear. Father Andre sniffed, slowly inhaled the air. It smelled of decay and death, so smelled a lost, tormented soul, not accepted by the afterlife. And this soul was here, in this house. Father Andre found the right apartment and knocked. I knocked harder again and heard a muffled female scream. It's open! He came in, the smell became stronger, tickled the nostrils with a suffocating stench of burning. Hello, I'm from St. Matriona Parish. I know you have a misfortune. Your neighbor called me. Maybe you need my help. The woman stared at the alien priest in a daze and could not understand what was the matter. What kind of help? Which neighbor? What do you need? Andre spoke calmly, even humbly, but tried to convey his thought agradably and clearly. I know that your husband died. I came here with God's word to make sure that everything is fine with you. Can we go into the kitchen and talk? The woman nodded and pointed towards the kitchen. Andre was the first to enter. There was a mountain of unwashed dishes in the shabby sink, a small three meter kitchen, as they say, smelled of tobacco smoke. A cockroach was running across the table among the half eaten plates. The woman followed and began to fussily clear the table, mumbling under his breath. Help. I need help, you see. Of course, I need it, as I'm going to raise these two children alone now. Father Andre was silent. He looked around the kitchen and saw in the corner, almost under the ceiling, a small shelf on which two icons stood under a layer of dust and in an old cobweb, big and smaller. He stood up and approached. Ignoring the woman, he took off the icon and wiped it with the sleeve of his cassock. What he saw instantly amazed him, even discouraged him. The holy face of St. Nicholas the Wonder Worker was circled with a felty pen. Circles were painted on his cheeks in red. His eyes were shaded with a black felty pen. Instead of lips pursed in humility, there was a wide smile. The second icon of the Mother of God with Jesus in her arms was also mutilated. And why did you spoil the icon so much? The woman looked up from the trash can, where she was raking the remains of the missing food from the plates. Who disfigured it? Am I? My dead husband did it. He says that sad icons should be made cheerful. She was flashing angry eyes, preparing to make a scandal. What do you need anyway? Why have you come? A funeral service for the deceased? So he's already in the morgue, and he was unbaptized. Andre looked into the woman's eyes, and in them he clearly saw a brilliant darkness, curled up in a ball, pulsating, ready to attack, waiting. The priest was silent and looked into the woman's eyes. Don't do that, baptized, unbaptized, we are all children of God. And you're not telling me that right now? The priest stood up and put his hand on the woman's forehead. She at first tried to look away, but could not. Father Andre spoke loudly and insistently. Who are you and what do you need? The woman trembled, but there was no response. Who are you and what do you need? The woman's lips parted, along with a wheeze, quiet words poured out. It's none of your business, Pop. I know my job as well as you do yours, and I'll do it. And what do you care about these people? Go away, go away, while you're safe. The priest nodded curtly. I see. Where is the soul of the dead servant of God who lived here? The hissing from the woman's mouth intensified. He's here. 
next to you. You can feel him. Suddenly the woman laughed. I think his name was Nikolai, just like the miracle worker on the icon that we decorated. Andrei removed his hand from the woman's forehead. She blinked in surprise and then tears began to flow from her eyes. Father, what have you done to me? What was that? Uh, nothing. Everything will pass. It is imperative that you and your children be baptized. And I'll take the icons with me, okay? The woman was silent and crying. Some kind of needle that burned in my soul with anger, as if it came out and disappeared, dissolved. It became easier for her to breathe. The world opened up with new colors, but only for a moment. Now she began to feel again how the darkness penetrates inside, instantly subdues, and already the darkness speaks with her voice. To be baptized? How so? Andre got up and went out into the corridor. It was here that he saw what the darkness wanted to possess, what she dreamed of getting into her paws, smelling of death and horror, whose souls she wanted to drink. Two boys stood in the hallway in their trousers, stripped to the waist. Kind faces, pure, innocent eyes in the depths of which curiosity and mischief appeared somewhere in the distance. Hello. The older boy smiled. The younger one was standing slightly behind but also smiled and said hello. Andre looked at me gently, kindly. Hello, boys. My heart was suffocated with pain. That's what evil was aiming for, pure, innocent souls. He wanted to embrace them, to shield them from the whole world with his cassock, to protect them, to help them find the way, but the main thing was to baptize, to baptize. He took a step towards them, but didn't have time to say anything, couldn't. Pain shot through him from behind, screaming like a wild cat right into the back of his head. He fell backwards and floated in a vast ocean of darkness under a black sky. The space around was colossal. It seemed to be born of itself out of nowhere and went back into itself in an endless slow cycle. Father Andre was aware of himself as a flying word, disembodied, but existing. He began to pray and a thin ray pierced the black thicket from above, on the tip of which light sparkled. It thundered. Servant of God, Andrew, put aside fear and go the right way. We know your intentions, and they are wonderful. Darkness was replaced by light, and Father Andre woke up in the very apartment where pain pierced him and he lost consciousness. He woke up on the floor, lying on his back, his body ached mercilessly. Besides darkness and light, there was another vision in his oblivion. A black creature with golden eyes was weaving a web with its filthy, hairy hands, spreading threads around, weaving around the walls of the apartment, painted icons, the entire entrance, and then the house. The creature whistled busily, sometimes laughing or grumbling. It doesn't matter. The creature was doing its job. It was weaving a net into which it was going to catch two innocent children's souls. Getting closer and closer, she ruined people, corrupted their souls with alcohol and immorality, snapped them out of life like seeds, and was preparing to take the last step. But Father Andre intervened in her plans. He got up from the floor and rubbed the back of his bruised head. It was she, after all, this woman whose house he came to. It was she who hit him from behind. The apartment was dark, smelled of damp and long unwashed things, smelled of sewage. Andre walked out of the kitchen along the corridor and saw out of the corner of his eye, in the hall, in the darkness, only slightly diffused by the light from the street, right in the middle of the room, a rope descended from the ceiling from the chandelier on which a woman was hanging. She committed suicide. The creature that enslaved her soul decided her fate in this way. First tried to kill an alien priest and then ordered her to hang herself. A black, terrible force, older than the world created by God for man. But Andre knew that there was another force that saved him, the pure force of goodness. He walked to the bedroom and heard the moan of the soul of a suicidal woman. The moans and growls of the soul of a man who died in this apartment heard the crackle of flames and the laughter of evil demons, their curses. All this is already in the eternal world, far away, but two bright souls remained in this world. He opened the bedroom with a sinking heart, afraid to see the worst, but fortunately for him, someone. Two boys were huddled in a ball on the bed, wrapped in a blanket. They cried, trying to do it as quietly as possible, afraid to attract someone's attention. Andre entered the bedroom, sat down on the bed and hugged the children. No one will scare you anymore. No one ever, I promise. At that moment, a black evil creature in its lair behind the plants of the human world was playing with two human souls, a female and a male, and howled with anger. Again, God defeated her, not allowing her to take over the children's souls. Again, her web burned under God's prayer. Saratov, 1993, the third story.
Henry Maguire woke up with a piercing scream. It was hard to breathe and somehow dark. He jumped up and ran to the light switch at the chiffonier, groped for it with a shaking hand and lit it. God, it's that damn nightmare again. A young 30-year-old man in only white swimming trunks walked to the sofa and sat down. In the light, fear faded into the background, but it was there. His chest hurt a lot, as if someone had been sitting on it while the man was sleeping. It was as if someone evil was stealing his breath. Henry had heard from his grandmother that cats living in the house could steal breath like that, but he didn't have a cat. He took a pack of cigarettes from the bedside table next to the sofa, pulled out an ashtray and lit a cigarette. Henry lived alone. He had no one to share his fears with, no one to lean on, eventually pour out his soul. And a lonely person for fear is the first victim that horror keeps in mind. At night, when Henry's soul ascended to the clouds and then into the dream world, it was calm and fresh. The window was open and the apartment was perfectly ventilated. This, by the way, was advised by the doctor treating Henry's sleeping disorder. The soul slowly stepped on the soft ground among the dense forest and walked forward. The sound of an axe could be heard somewhere. Everything was covered with a non-inflated fog. But it was as if it was ordinary and ordinary. Henry walked forward until he heard a familiar voice above him. Have you come here again, Henry? Do you want to talk again? In his dream, Henry shook his head, realizing himself. I don't want anything. You constantly torment me. I hear your voice in my dreams and in reality. What do you want from me? The landscape began to change, darkening. Now Henry was no longer in the middle of the forest, but in a musty underground room where the silhouette of a bent man in a black hoodie was barely visible in the candlelight at the table. Was it a man? Henry didn't know. Who are you? What do you want? The candle flame swayed with the movement. The voice was low, guttural and inhuman. I'm Borgia. I need... I just need your life. I need all of you. And I'll take mine. The hoodie lifted. Two shiny black eyes, half decomposed facial tissues, and a dropped jaw slid across Henry from under the black cloth. This caused the very fright that instantly threw Henry out of his sleep. In the morning, he decided to go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist in general to seek professional help. He couldn't handle it anymore. He knew the reason or rather suspected. Although no, the reason was obvious to him, but her sensitivity denial to himself made Henry think that it was not at all about his addictions. And so he finally came to the psychologist in his surprisingly gloomy office. A middle-aged man, swarthy, with an even stubble, greeted briefly and began to collect some papers from the table. You know, the repairmen are coming to my office now. The light is out of order. Let's go to another place. Henry nodded in surprise. The doctor went out into the corridor and called, Come with me. The two of them reached the elevator and went down to the lowest floor. No, not to the first, but to the basement. The doctor was staring at a single point in front of him. But when the elevator doors opened, he turned around. Don't be surprised. We also have offices there. Let's just say they're on duty. Come on. Five minutes later, Henry was lying on a shabby white couch with a headrest and the psychologist was sitting next to him and to his even greater surprise began to smoke. So are you comfortable and are you ready to tell me what's bothering you? Henry hesitated at first. What he wanted to tell from the very beginning, what was forming the right chain now seemed somehow strange, even a little stupid. The doctor felt it. There is no need to be shy. Tell everything as it is and from the very beginning. I'm trying to help you. Get started. Henry sighed. You see, doctor, I don't even know what to call it. I'm not that addicted, but sometimes I indulge in something forbidden. Well, you know what I'm talking about, so I go to a man and ask him to give it to me as usual, and he says that there is no usual, but there is something else. He says the name and the price, and I take this shit. A week goes by, another, a third, and then I pick up something new again. But that's not the point. I started having nightmares. I'm dreaming about some strange dude who looks like a demon. His name is Borgia, and he wants to take over my soul or something. I don't understand. The doctor nodded significantly. After Henry stopped talking, he took a long pause and spoke. You know, I think I can help you. Some nationalities have such a technique. The transfer of their self. You just need to shake hands and then part of your consciousness will go to the person you shook hands with. That is, you voluntarily give a part of yourself associated with fears to another person. The main thing is to do it voluntarily. The doctor held out his hand. 
Give me a part of yourself and I will try to help you. At first Henry held out his hand but then he pulled it back and after a few seconds he was walking quickly down the corridor. He did not extend his hand but somewhere in the black plains of existence under the light of the Borgia flame angrily jerked his head and howled. He was a soul catcher, ancient as life itself, with desires scarier than the most terrible horror. And Henry's soul did not get into his net. I haven't got it now, but everything is still ahead. New York, 23, the fourth story. Gog looked at them, his glasses slightly slipped down his big, bumpy nose. al kaf as the venerable Jabrail said, translates as cave from Arabic. The Quran is there now but not as a book, but as a possible witnessing embodiment of knowledge. The embodiment of what? Vitek, like Grika, could not understand anything. Gog probably understood, but did not know how to explain it to two curious people. Understand, the Quran is a book transmitted through Jabrail to the Prophet Muhammad. May Allah be pleased with him. The Quran contains surahs consisting of verses. To put it simply, these are sections of paragraphs. Surahs have their own names. One of them is Cave. The inscriptions that you saw on the forehead of the angel after death are Al-Fatiha, that is, opening the book. And the Quran can be in the line of any surah and any verse. Now he is being embodied as a source of knowledge in the cave. That's where we'll find him. Do you understand? Both of the dead soldiers nodded, but Gog saw in their eyes that they did not understand anything. The giant sighed sullenly and waved his hand. Okay, let's wait. What? Vitek and Grika were looking at Gog. You'll see, have patience, let's wait. Grika and Vitek sat down on the trunk of a fallen palm tree and waited. Gog stared stubbornly in the direction of the bazaar, from where they came to the palm grove. Everything seemed unusual, strange and stupefyingly interesting, both to Vitka and Grika. It used to seem that Islam was something so rustic, mossy and strict. Now it was visible to the naked eye that Islam is a religion in which one must certainly pray, thereby confirming unity with God. At the same time, it is necessary to pray both on earth and here after death. Vitek remembered the Muslims he knew from the debate. They all prayed, although they did not always do it regularly, but very often. Before prayer, they respectfully washed their hands or wiped them clean of dirt. Emelia, a Tatar from the second company, by the way, also sometimes prayed out loud. I remembered it right now. Grika sat next to Vitka and asked himself questions. If the Almighty sent down the Quran, does it mean that everything written in it is from God? And who sent down the Bible? It could not be said that his family was religious, although his father often liked to say, well, eyes are the measure, faith is in the heart, and conscience is the guarantee. And they used to go to the church. Well, if it's Easter or some other day, then they celebrated it with a trip to the temple, for sure. In principle, the rite consisted only in the ability to be baptized, well, and kiss the cross in church. It is a pity, of course, that I did not have a chance to read the Quran during my lifetime. Sorry. That's it. We'll be leaving soon. Victor and Grika got up and approached Gog. What's the matter? Gog said nothing. He watched as a man in antique clothes, wrapping himself in thin blankets, approached along the path from the bazaar to the palm grove. The man was getting closer and Grika and Vitek also noticed him. Who's that? Be polite. The man approached Gog and cupped his hands over his hair. Gog also put on a hand to his hair and put the other hand on the wanderer's shoulder. Salam alaikum, dear. Are you one of those who were immersed in a dream in a cave? The wanderer nodded his head. Tell us where that cave is. We want to know the knowledge transmitted in the Quran. In the name of Allah, the merciful and merciful. The wanderer paused and simply pointed his finger behind Gog's back. The giant turned around. Instead of a palm grove, there was a sheer cliff in front of them, in which the mouth of a small dark cave opened. When Gog turned back to thank the wanderer, he was gone. Follow me. Gog entered the cave and stepped over the sleeping dog. More precisely, it seemed that he simply did not notice her and walked forward, but the guys noticed and stepped over. A little further on, they saw four or five young men lying down and periodically turning around. The giant turned around and put his finger to his lips. Hush, they're sleeping. We're moving on. Grika and Vitek followed the giant further into the cave. The light from the entrance stopped penetrating inside and they walked further and further. Gog may have seen in the dark, but the frontline soldiers kept bumping into some ledges and obstacles. Grika stopped and reached into the pocket of his breeches. Wait, Vitek, wait. 
I'm going to get the lighter. Yes, damn it, where is it? He rummaged in his pockets, patted them, then the pocket of his tunic and pulled out a small lighter. A faint light lit up the walls of the cave. Let the rebe light. We take look at around. They were a walking through a narrow Budhag tunnel, and ahead, a little further away, the figure of Gog loomed like an indistinct shadow. Hey, Gog, wait up! Vitek and Grika rushed forward through the tunnel, but Gog did not think to wait for them. The lighter suddenly went out. My god, Grika, what are you doing? Light it up soon! Grika tried to light the lighter again, but the wheel striking on the silicon was firmly stuck. Well, what do you have there? Light up! Yes, I'm already lighting up for the hundredth time. It's not burning, it's broken. Give it here. Vitek impatiently groped for the lighter from his friend's hands and tried it himself. I'm telling you, it's broken. So what should I do now? The guy is called Gog, but to no avail. What are we going to do, Vitek? Listen, let's try to go back. Come on. But I'm honestly not sure where to go. I lost my bearings in this darkness. Okay, wait. I was walking in front, then I turned to you. So we need to go straight and you need to go back. I'm coming for you. Vitek put his hand on Grika's shoulder and they started walking. Just like the blind. There are blind people? Vitek was holding on to his friend's shoulder. No, I'm not talking about that. I once read about the First World War in a history textbook. There was not even a textbook, but an encyclopedia with illustrations. That's how the British fighters were depicted there. So what? Vitek stumbled and almost fell. Grika, come on, walk more smoothly. Yes, I'm coming. Well, there the British, who survived the gas attack, went completely blind and followed the guide in a line, holding a hand on each other's shoulder like a centipede. The guides were walking, as it seemed to them, to the exit. Yes, they started it in the first war. My uncle told me how it was, but in general terms, I didn't like to remember. Grika walked in front, holding out his hand to avoid bumping into the ledge. You'd think they'd have done less in the second. But how many more will they do? At least there were no tanks in the first place. There were, Grika. Well, there were, but what kind of tanks are there? One laugh. Laughter, not laughter, but those tanks also had machine guns and cannons. Grika stopped. Listen, according to my estimates, we've been walking in the same direction for about an hour, and we walked inside for about 15 minutes. There's no way out. So what? Are we lost or something? And who said that we need to go back? Susanin, your mother. Grika, be quiet. Stop yelling. Let me think. Vitek leaned against the wall and thought about what he had made a mistake. Yes, that's right. They walked forward, then turned to Grika. This Gog, too. The Kolomenskaya Verst galloped ahead. Vitek slid down the wall and squatted down. Vitek, are you here? Yes, here, here. Listen, Grika, let's wait. It seems to me that we are certainly not in danger of starvation. Gog will eventually realize that he has broken away from us and will return. Didn't you come up with anything better? Grika also squatted down and leaned against the wall with his back. You'll figure it out here of all the possible wonders, which I've read about is probably the most grandiose. What are you talking about? Yes, about all this. If you tell someone, they won't believe you. Grika sighed. Who are you going to tell now? We are here and everyone is there. That's what it is. Although probably those who are in our stronghold are unlikely to have visited Muslims. Yeah, and you're such an experienced fighter. You've seen it yourself with Gulkin's horseradish. No, where is this quagmire? I don't know. Something is making me sleepy. Vitek sat back and rested his head on his shoulder. Yes, what else did you think of? Grika poked Vitka in the side. Come on, get up, let's move on. Yeah. Grika pushed Vitka countless times and shook him, but he only snored loudly and then completely lay down on the floor of the tunnel, pulled his knees up to his chest and slept like a child. The first thing that came to Grika's mind was to kick Vitka with all the dope in the ass, but it was a pity, still a comrade. Grika called Vitka a couple more times, but then gave up this useless activity. Let him sleep, get enough sleep and wake up. It doesn't take much time and it will probably take a long time to wait. Or maybe it's forever? Nah, eventually the angels will come to the rescue. This thought stuck firmly in Grika's head. He even called out into the darkness several times. Eustatius! But the angel did not arrive. Maybe they didn't have access to the Muslim strongholds. Vitek was snoring on the floor, but among his rumblings, Grika began to distinguish some other sounds. Neither the voice nor the sobs. 
It was immediately unclear and then Grija decided to go to the voice. And Vitek, nothing, it's not going anywhere. Grija followed the sound. Human speech was becoming clearer and clearer. Two and two make four. Four times four is 16. Grika walked on and on until he saw a light, barely perceptible light at the end of the tunnel. That's the way out. Not afraid to stumble, Grika ran towards the light source looming a hundred meters ahead. The voice was getting louder. 250 by 250, 62,500. 62,500 by 62,500. Grika heard a voice right next to him, looked around and saw a young guy whose head was covered with a turban. The guy rocked back and forth, sitting on his knees and repeating the numbers, multiplying them over and over again. A dim lamp burned in front of the guy, or rather not even a lamp, but a lamp filled with oil. The guy did not pay attention to Grika and did not stop multiplying the numbers. Grika shook the guy by the shoulder. Hey kid, what are you doing? The guy did not pay attention to this, but continued his occupation. Yeah, it turns out to be some crazy people here. Grika stood, looking at the rocking of the blessed mathematician and did not know what to do. I listened. The guy called the numbers that did not fit in Grika's head. Suddenly, the guy stopped talking. Well, are you done? Grika thought that the guy would enter into a dialogue with him, or at least pay attention, but the guy closed his eyes and whispered. The universal absolute, the moment of the appearance of the Quran. In an instant, everything cracked, grated and roared around. Grika fell back and opened his mouth in fear and delight. A huge crack appeared in the sheer wall of the tunnel which passed through the vaults. Pieces fell off from the rock and a stone head appeared in them. Maybe it wasn't a head but a ball the size of a hut appeared in the crack. For some reason it immediately seemed that it was the crown of the head. Then a stone hand appeared in the gap which landed on the ground right in front of Grika. He barely managed to crawl away. The guy wasn't around. Grika wanted to shout at him to get out, but he just didn't see him. Getting up, Grika raised his arms, bending them at the elbows and wanted to give a run to Vitka, shake him and run without looking back. But suddenly, he heard a loud voice from behind. Stop! You have not read the word of the Almighty, but I will testify about you on the Day of Judgment. Don't turn around. Grika was just about to turn around, but after the warning, he did not do so. Your fate follows the moonlight and is beyond your control. You are just people and you will live as you are destined to. Don't try to change anything. You cannot deceive fate. It will deceive you a thousand times. But you do not. I am the Quran. I am the absolute of both worlds. I am the greatness of the world and you are just dust. The Afterlife of Muslims, 1944. Arpita Vatsim Kome.